the last talk this afternoon, uh, a uh, well, a speaker that we've had a couple of times before at the NLU this year. It's always been fun. Uh, Toby, author of the R&D tool, I think uh, everybody knows it and works with it. Uh, and uh, today he's going to tell all kind of uh, gory details coming from his GitHub <laughs> repo, from the trenches of development of uh, all kind of other uh, other software as well. Uh, yeah, Toby is an uh, independent consultant, can I tell you that? Well, with four colleagues, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, and uh, he's, uh, he's doing his work mostly in Switzerland and some gigs outside. And so, well, take it away, Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk in English since I have no clue about Dutch, unfortunately. Uh, I tried it, I sat in the other uh, hall just before, and, and there was always this question, do you speak, or is anyone here who doesn't know Dutch? And I was always the only one who raised his hand, like in the other talks, and so for the last talk I didn't raise my hand, but it didn't help, I didn't understand anything, so, yeah. Um, okay, uh, people know me because of RD tool, and so that's the thing I'm going to talk about first. Um, I heard that some people think RD tool is not being maintained anymore, not being developed anymore. Uh, so I just released RD tool 1.7 today, this afternoon, just to play <laughs> 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 um, Okay, but uh, when I when I look at my mailbox, I see that many people are still using RD tool. 1.3, 1.4, whatever in their Red Hat 3.0 version <laughs> is present. Um, and so I like to uh, highlight some of the features which have been introduced in RD tool 1.5 and 1.6. Uh, maybe the, the most overlooked and coolest feature RD tool learned in, the, in recent years is the source and the template option for create. So for those of you who have ever worked with RD tool, you may know that once you've created a database, it's not so easy to change it. Like there are some ways, but in general, you have to decide how long you want to keep stuff and what you want to keep, and then you just let it run. Uh, now, sometimes people have very interesting data in their RD database, and Still, they want to play, keep the data but change the format. And so, with RD2 1.6, you can actually uh, use these options source and template to load data from an existing RD file to pre populate a new RD file. So, when you create a new RD file, you can say, make it the same as this existing RD file, then you'll just copy the setup of the existing RD file, or you can tell it to load data from an existing RD file into a new RD file. And in that way, you can modify and change anything you want. It uh, doesn't matter if you change the resolution or the retention time or anything, it'll just do its best based on the existing data. Um, another cool new feature in RD tool 1.6 is that you can write, um, that's, that's what's sort of a virtual data source in a graph. So when you're creating a graph with RD tool, you can pull data from existing uh, data you just collected, and it, it shows up in the graph as is, but you can also apply math to the data before it's been shown. So this can be something simple like multiply the the data you've collected with eight, so that you get bits instead of bytes, stuff like that. And with version 1.6, I added uh, options which allow you to take the actual time into consideration. So with um, this little thing here, you can accumulate the data during a month. And so as the data 
comes in, it will accumulate, 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 and you get a sawtooth kind of chart, which always breaks the tooth at the end of the month. So even if it's an irregular granularity like a month, which doesn't isn't always the same amount of time, it will still work. So it will cut off after 28 days or 29 days or 31 days, depending on whatever month you're in. Um, and finally, some people, they like RD tool, but they store their data elsewhere. So they just want to use RD tool for the charts to create PNGs or PDFs. Um, and with this extension here, the CV data source, you can write a callback. Now, at the moment, it's only implemented in Python and in Perl, but you can write a callback in a scripting language. And whenever RD tool needs data, it calls that callback for data. So you can write whatever method you want to gather your data and to store it, and then use this uh, callback data source to fetch the data into the graph and then show it alongside other data. Uh, these def lines don't have to be uniform, so you can pull in data from a data source coming from a file and also from the callback at the same time. Yeah, that, that's what I wanted to tell about RD tool. Now, the other stuff I'm going to talk about are little things I publish in my GitHub repo. So I work by creating tools which don't exist yet for companies who have special requirements. And often the company doesn't actually sell software, so they just, they just need a solution to their problem, and then they don't mind if I publish the tool as well as open source. So uh, most of these things have been paid for by companies and it was okay for them so, to, for me to publish it. So you'll find them in my GitHub repo. Uh, one thing uh, a company wanted was that when they have their RD charts, um, these days people are not happy with static charts anymore. So they want them to be animated. And, and so the first thing uh, many people or several people have already looked at when talking about RD tool is whether they can actually pull the data from RD tool and pass it into the browser and then use uh, SVG to draw the graph and, and just pull in more data from the back end when the graph has to move or has to scale. And I also implemented something like this, but I soon found that there are many things that you can do with RD tool which actually require quite a lot of data to be transported to the browser in order for something interactive to happen. And so I thought, what about um, those graphs? They're actually pretty fast in creation. So when I ask RD tool to create a new chart, a new PNG file, that just goes like this. It doesn't take a long time. So couldn't the browser just Continually, continuously request PNGs when somebody actually tries to zoom the graph or shift the graph. And that actually works. And it didn't work 10 or 15 years ago, but these days, it's no problem. So, uh, I've got a little demo here. callback data source to fetch the data into the graph and then show it alongside other data. Uh, these def lines don't have to be uniform, so you can pull in data from a data source, coming from a file, and also from a callback at the same time. Yeah, that, that's what I wanted to tell about RD tool. Now, the other stuff I'm going to talk about are little things I publish in my GitHub repo. So I work by creating tools which don't exist yet for companies who have special requirements. And often the company doesn't actually sell software, so they just, they just need a solution to their problem, and then they don't mind if I publish 
the tool as well as open source. So um, most of these things have been paid for by companies and it was okay for them so to, for me to publish it. So you'll find them in my GitHub repo. Um, one thing uh, a company wanted was that when they have their RB charts, um, these days people are not happy with static charts anymore, so they want them to be animated. And, and so the first thing uh, many people, or several people have already looked at when talking about RB tool is whether they can actually pull the data from RB tool and pass it into the browser and then use uh, SVG to draw the graph and, and just pull in more data from the back end when the graph has to move or has to scale. And I also implemented something like this, but I soon found that there are many things that you can do with RD tool which actually require quite a lot of data to be transported to the browser in order for something interactive to happen. And so I thought, what about um, those graphs? They're actually pretty fast in creation. So when I ask RD tool to create a new chart, a new PNG file, that just goes like this. It doesn't take a long time. So couldn't the browser just Continue, continuously request PNGs when somebody actually tries to zoom the graph or shift the graph. And that actually works. And it didn't work 10 or 15 years ago, but these days, it's no problem. So, uh, I've got a little demo here. So, for those who, who know SmokePing, that's created by SmokePing. And you can just, and that's just a normal RD tool chart, which just gets requested over this slow VLAN from Switzerland, from my server. It's nothing special, no Docker farm or anything. It's just a single script. It's actually smoke ping. It, it's the normal smoke ping shipping these charts. Uh, now, the interesting thing about this little extension is that you can very easily integrate it into your own projects. So if you have uh, an application which generates RD graphs on demand, so just based on the, the call on the, on the GET request, your application gets it, creates a chart and you can tell it when the chart should be and what size and so on, then you can use this extension. And all you have to do is you have to, to load this uh, JavaScript library and uh, then you can activate whatever uh, image elements you have in your, uh, in your HTML document. And instead of, for an image, document, uh, image element, instead of putting a source attribute here, you put a data source template attribute. And in this template, you can place uh, these uh, moustache uh, placeholders and there is start, there is end, there are more, there is width, height, there is a random number and once you've done that and your backend actually understands these requests then your graph is live. So there is no additional programming required if you have a backend that is able to produce graphs on demand. In these slides, there's always uh, the link to GitHub up here. So if, you, if you're interested in one of these things, uh, you can either go to the slides, which are linked off down here, or you can go straight to GitHub and find the stuff in GitHub. Um, yeah, a library. Oh, that, that was a cool thing. Uh, so I have this customer, and they, they provide web services or actually they, they don't provide web services, they have a special customer base, all the, uh, all the medical people in Switzerland, not all of them, but many, and they provide email for them, and they provide special, or an infrastructure for other companies to provide web services to this medical personnel. And by using their service, they can be sure that it's actually doctor or whoever uh, they have strong authentication to 
to make sure that whoever uses these services is actually the person. Uh, uh, yeah, he says he is. Now, there is a problem. It works fine with people working in private practice who have their PC and then install a special job application on that PC and um, that, does a, that does a proxy and they use localhost as their proxy point and then they just get routed to that special web service farm. Now, if they want to attach a whole company, like a hospital, that's sort of tedious to install this special client on all the, on all the workstations. And so the idea was to have sort of a, a proxy server sitting at the hospital um, and then all the workstations get configured to use this proxy server. Um, now, how do I figure out who is actually being who is actually working on the workstation when they come into my proxy server. And since the world is ruled by Microsoft, there is actually a very simple uh, way to do that. Um, all these Windows web browsers, they can do single sign-on authentication if they're configured properly. So they'll just authenticate against the web server they're talking to, without the user doing any anything, basically, just it, it just happens. Uh, the problem is they normally only do that when they talk to a Windows server. And since I implement most stuff in Linux, that wasn't really helpful for me. So the idea was to simulate a Windows server towards a uh, Microsoft browser or any browser running on a, on a Windows machine so that it can authenticate against the Linux machine and the Linux machine transports this authentication to the Windows server and figures out whether that user can actually is actually that user and then everything works. So uh, in order to make that possible I wrote a Perl module and it's called NetLDAP Espinigo. Espinigo is the uh, protocol uh, Windows servers talk to to allow this authentication to happen. And the cool thing is what you can do with this module, you can set up a web service which will authenticate any incoming request from a Windows client and use that authentication process to log into LDAP on the Windows server. So after the user has authenticated, you have an open LDAP connection to the Windows server. Now, for one, you know, okay, it's that user because the authentication worked, but you also have access to the Windows server as that user. So you can figure out all sorts of stuff about that user, like which groups he belongs to. Uh, if he can do changes to Active Directory, you can even do changes to Active Directory through that connection. Um, it's really helpful, it's really cool. And it, it's sort of a security thing, but... <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't exist before, so it, it, it's just there. Um, yeah. So I, I guess you've secured all your websites nowadays. There, there is no HTTP anymore, right? It's all HTTPS, and thanks to Let's Encrypt, or at least for me, it's thanks to Let's Encrypt. And when I when I first heard about Let's Encrypt, I was all enthusiastic. Like, yes, I need that. And then I went to the Let's Encrypt website and, and looked how, how can I actually create a certificate. And they had this nice tool which you could download, but you had to run it as a root. Because it sudos and does strange things to web servers and just which can't happen on, on a system really. I don't want just some tool messing with my config files. So uh, I wrote Acme Fetch, which uh, gets you certificates from Let's Encrypt and stores them where you tell it to store them. It doesn't need access to a web server. Well, it needs, needs access to a directory which is exported by your web server, but it doesn't mess with the configuration of your web server. It doesn't try to understand your web server. It just does what you tell it to do. There is a configuration file. Uh, you, you can set up all the options, let's encrypt, let's set, and 
then you run it and it fetches all the certificates. Uh, it can also check whether your certificates are still valid. Um, and if they're not valid anymore, then it can refetch the certificate after three months. So it lets you do all your housekeeping. You have to do with Let's Encrypt. And we use that on our web servers and it works very well. So th this other client, they had, they had all these, uh, or they have all these, I think it's firewalls, yeah, firewall appliances. And for some reason, they found that they want their firewall, the, the log files from the firewall appliances to be um, not to not be sent via syslog protocol or anything. They want to download them, the log files of the firewalls. And it's many, many log files, many firewalls, and they get rotated. So the log files on the firewalls, they get written, and then at some point, they get rotated. And they want to make sure that they get all the log files once they're rotated. But since that's just a client, right? They, they just wanted that. Okay, so um, they, these things are challenges for me. They, they have these questions. I say, well, I need to solve it differently, but if you want that, how? So the idea was that once a file is rotated, it doesn't change its timestamp anymore. So the, the, the identifier of the rotated file is not its name, but its timestamp. The problem is that those files get rotated along, so it, depending on how it's configured, it could be that it gets rotated pretty fast. And so while I'm looking at the files, they already get they're not at dot zero anymore, they're at dot one, dot two, dot three, and I don't want to fetch the same file twice. So I wrote this log fetcher tool, and when I did this, I was totally into writing tools which work with non-blocking uh, structures. So it's, it's just a single process, but it starts off a, a separate SSH process for each of the hosts, it's mon it monitors, and then it starts downloading files through these SSH channels, all in parallel into a single process running on the server, uh, having them compressed on the, on the different firewalls. And as the, the blocks come into the, the central point, they get then stored into files on a, on a disk array attached to the central point with names based on the file change time, uh, as seen on the server. And it doesn't need any installation on these uh, firewalls. So it just logs in via SSH, uses stacked to figure out the timestamp of the files, and then it uses, uh, I think, gzip or cat, depending on, or was it, is it DD? I don't know. Anyway, it just uses standard tools running on these machines to actually get the content of the file. And the only thing it needs is SSH access to the box. And since it's only one process on the server, uh, it just needs to fork SSH connections, but you don't have copies of the actual log fetching logic on that server as well. So you can get data from quite a lot of uh, places at the same time. And since it's doing that in parallel, it doesn't also matter if some of the data is coming in slowly, because that doesn't block the progress. <coughs> Yeah, that custom they what so they're a research outfit and they have um, yeah lots of different researchers but they're also like doing commercial stuff so it's not just like a university where everything's open and they needed a system where people could send them large files. Now they used to just put them on Dropbox, but since it's sort of sensitive stuff, they didn't want to have it in the open. And so I, I created the upload service for them. And the upload service lets you set up a service where each member of staff has their own sort of inbox on the web. And the cool thing about the upload service is that it's not just a file upload, it's actually using the JavaScript file um, object. So instead of just using the upload mechanism in HTML forms, it opens the file 
from via this file object and sends packets of the file to this upload service. And so even if the connection gets broken, it will resume. Because the problem is what they found is that if they upload multi-gigabyte files, depending on where in the world they are, they never finish because they always break down at some point during the upload. And so with the upload service, using the file object, we can actually upload huge files and eventually they'll finish depending on your uh, connection speed, but there'll never be a problem if you get disconnected from the internet or uh, if for some reason it's very slow. Again, this is uh, using non-blocking uh, handling of these incoming data packets. Yeah, you, you can even test it if you want to send a file to me. Now, uh, it's very boring because you can just send the file and then it disappears. So, but you, you can actually see how it's being sent. You can send a whole bunch of files in parallel and you can see little uh, bars advancing over your screen. Does he not like me anymore? Oops. Back here, cable disconnected. Slow pieces. Have you, have you ever had that problem where uh, someone comes to you and tells you, yeah, everything's slow in the network? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's sort of the, the worst, right? And, and so people do all sorts of strange things. Um, and at some point, they also su suspect maybe it's not the network, maybe it's the PCs, maybe it's some application, but nobody knows. So. Uh, I, I created the GPS meter, and that's actually my first C sharp Windows program. Yay! <laughs> um, so the idea was that why is the network slow? The network is slow because the person sitting at the at the, at the machine perceives it to be slow. At least at the moment, because we don't have any other information. So. It's important to, to consider that and to take that person who's sitting at the desktop and is being annoyed uh, seriously and actually have them become part of the solution by asking them or giving them an outlet to, to report what they're seeing. And now the thing is configurable. This here is a, is a fist, right? So sort of to show your fist, not just keep it in your pocket. Um, <laughs> And, and deploying this tool has two very interesting effects. For one, uh, people actually like that you do something because it's visible on the screen. So they now have something. Uh, and the other thing is it actually helps because with this, if now you have to respond to these, to these things which get sent to you. You have to take them seriously. But once you do that, and people actually send the information, you suddenly get a picture when these slow network incidents happen. You get timestamps, and behind the scenes here, you can even uh, issue some additional commands. So this thing will send you a list of processes, it, will, it can take a screenshot if the user doesn't disable it, stuff like that. So you can do things on the PC at the moment when the person is most unhappy with the performance. And so in the case of this uh, customer, what they figured out is that for some reason they have neglected to put in... Is it GPF an acronym for something? Yes. It stands for? It stands for... Um, I'll, I'll tell that story. Right. Uh, so so the, it turned out that the, the problem was that they neglected to put in 
a patch into the Windows boxes half a year ago, uh, which had fixed the, the application of updates. And so the machines, I don't know, every whatsoever often went out and tried to fetch uploads and failed and sort of got into a very terrible bad state while trying to fetch that huge upload which grew um, and were barely useful. So the network was fine. It's just the machines, they just ground to hold and everything was running over the machine. They had void and all sorts of nice things and there was nothing apparent on the screen while he was doing that. It was just that and so yeah. Since they got the reports, they not, then knew when to what to look for in the log or at what point to look in the log files and they found that it's always this update service running which was killing them. Yeah, and then they fixed it. So um, um, GPF meter uh, I think it's called grounded performance. It's grounded performance feedback meter. Right, grounded performance feedback meter. Now we need to, now, so in German, or in Swiss German, if you're really unhappy, you can say Gopf, which means, uh, Gopf Tami, which means something with the Lord, and it's not very, like, and so, but, so, but it's grounded performance feedback meter. <laughs> and that's why there's the fist. <laughs> also slamming. <laughs> and and uh, this thing actually is is uh, as compiled executable. And you, you can just download it off GitHub and put it on a machine. You don't even need to install it or anything. Just you run it and then it spits out a little JSON config file which has to live in the same directory 